Okay. So uh, there was one question um, where there's a way to calculate the integral in four dimensions, like the omega to z transform. Uh, the answer for general, for general, so so in, in high dimensions, you have to worry about the shape of the region. It's not it's not just an interval; it has some some shape. Um, and the answer is that um, there's a way to do this for spherical regions. Um, but not for general regions. There are many things that are known. There are many things that are known. Various contributions are known. There are holographic calculations that can be done, uh, but there isn't as, as universal an answer as, as in two dimensions. Okay, and there was another question. Uh, why at the defect point is the Einstein equation not satisfied? Uh, so the, we concluded from this, um, calculation here that uh, there's an angular coordinate that's identified 2 pi n. Okay, so this is this is not a smooth manifold. On, on any, so um, on a smooth manifold, angular coordinates have to be identified mod 2 pi. A coordinate invariant way of saying it is that on a smooth manifold, uh, if you have a, a circle of proper radius r, then the circumference must be 2 pi r as you take r to 0. Because the definition of a smooth manifold is one that's locally rn. And that will always be true. OK, so then those are all the questions on Slack for now. All right. So now we'll proceed uh, by basically repeating this for quantum gravity. Uh, there's going to be, it's going to be quite similar, but there are two key differences. The first uh, is that we're now doing gravity. And in gravity, you have to, uh, well, in gravity, the metric is dynamical. And the dominant contributions to the path integral often come from, usually come from uh, solutions that satisfy the equations of motion, the Einstein equation. Uh, and the Einstein equations don't like conical defects. They don't like conical excesses. The Einstein equations like smooth manifolds. Uh, so if you want to solve the Einstein equations, you're going to end up with a manifold that's smooth at the branch point, this defect point. The fact that, so in other words, the, when you do the replica calculation, the geometry will back react uh, in, on these replica manifolds. And it'll cause them to be smooth at the defect. This leads to an extra term in the entropy, which is exactly the area term uh, familiar from black hole entropy. That's the first main difference, the, the presence of the area term, which comes from the back reaction, the replica manifold. The second main difference, um, which is the new ingredient in the island story, is that uh, you can have higher topology contributions to the gravitational path integral. And these higher topologies are going to be responsible for the island. OK, so let's proceed. As a warm up, and um, many of the important features are, are going to be seen here, we're going to look first at the eternal Schwarzschild. Uh, so this is the Gibbon talking calculation of the black hole entropy. This is not doing, I'm not doing islands here. I just want to talk about the ordinary generalized entropy of a black hole. Recall the near horizon metric of the short shell black hole in Euclidean signature was ds squared is rho squared dte squared plus d rho squared plus dot, dot, dot. We derived that last time. Uh, and this is just, um, lo well, not, I shouldn't say locally. Let me say for, for rho much less than one, uh, we just get a disk. So we have a disk where the radial coordinate is rho, the distance from the horizon. The angular coordinate 
is the Euclidean time. Uh, and remember that rho is, um, actually I don't, I don't remember what the definition of, of rho was with all the factors and everything. The important thing is that rho equals zero is the horizon, r equals rs. Far from the black hole, uh, the metric um, is the GTT in the Schwarzschild metric just becomes one far from the black hole. Okay, so the first term, if you go far from the black hole, just one uh, plus one DTE squared plus dot, dot, dot. Uh, and so combining these, and, and the, in fact, if you look at the whole metric, the GTT just interpolates from being row squared to being one. Um, so um, what is the metric associated to this one? Well, that would be a cylinder. The, the, the metric, uh, if, you, if, if, the, if the angular coordinate just shows up as DTE squared, that, that looks like a cylinder. Uh, so we have a geometry that interpolates between a disk and a cylinder. Thus, the TER geometry uh, looks something like this. It's a cylinder far away, uh, but then it turns into a disk. Near, so this is um, geometry that's called the cigar geometry. Uh, it's on the left is uh, the horizon, R equals RS is a point on the left. Uh, so you'll see that if we cut out a small disk, if we cut out a small region around the horizon, then it has the geometry of a disk. Uh, whereas if we go uh, out here, so R is R is going to the right. So out here is R. Out here is very far from the black hole. Um, so out here, um, it's turning into a cylinder. So this is just putting together the whole geometry of the black hole. Um, As an exercise, I recommend you work through this for yourself and convince yourself that this is what the picture looks like. Look at the whole geometry of the Euclidean black hole um, and understand that this is the um, this is how you would draw that as an embedded picture. I think this is probably familiar to many of you. So now we can discuss the partition function. When we calculate a partition function, z of beta in field theory, we do a path integral, we, we do a path integral on a cylinder. In gravity, you don't get to pick what you don't get to pick what manifolds you want. You have to integrate over, met, over metrics. So you have to integrate over manifolds. You do get to pick your boundary condition. Uh, so the, the analogous thing um, to what we did in quantum field theory, the analogous thing in gravity is to do a path integral where you integrate over metrics and over all your other quantum fields, the Euclidean action. Um, where now uh, you specify the boundary condition So when you do this path integral, you specify the boundary condition that um, Euclidean time is asymptotically uh, a circle of size beta. And we're supposed to integrate over all manifolds with that boundary condition. The, um, I don't know a great way to represent this. So in, in field theory, we had these nice pictures that represented path integrals. 
And it was easy to do that because we specify the geometry first and then we do the path integral on that geometry. Uh, now it's a little trickier because we're supposed to we're supposed to integrate over geometries, but I'm going to represent it this way. So we have a we have a geometry which is asymptotically um, sorry, it's asymptotically a circle of size beta, uh, but We're not, gonna, we're not allowed to specify how this geometry is filled in away from, uh, from infinity. That's up to, uh, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna do the path integral over all possible geometries that fill in this boundary condition. Of course, we don't in general know how to do that path integral in quantum gravity, uh, but we can often approximate it using uh, saddle points, con saddle point contributions to the path integral so if there's a saddle point, then we expect this to be dominated by the saddle, by the saddle point with um, the answer given by um, the Euclidean action. Um, times the contribution. So let me write it this way. There's a gravitational part, which is the Euclidean action of the saddle point. And then there's a matter part, uh, which comes from the quantum fields on that geometry. So let's say we want to calculate the partition function of gravity at temperature beta. What this procedure says is that we're supposed to integrate over all metrics with the circle of size beta. We don't know how to do that, so we're going to find saddle points. Well, we know one saddle point. We know one saddle point of the path integral uh, with a circle of size beta. It was exactly what we what we found up here when we when we looked at the Euclidean geometry of the black hole. This is a solution of the Einstein equations, uh, which has the appropriate boundary conditions, and uh, is therefore a candidate uh, to give us the dominant contribution of the partition function, and. In many cases, not all cases, but we're going to assume we're in a situation where this is the dominant contribution to the path integral. Um, so in that case, uh, the partition function is given by a term um, which is just the gravitational action on evaluated on the Euclidean Schwarzschild um, solution. And then there's a matter contribution, uh, which is the path integral of the matter fields, also on this background. So also evaluated on the Euclidean Schwarzschild solution. So this is a uh, way of evaluating this path integral approximately. It's important to note that the full path integral would require UV completion. If you really wanted, we don't, we don't know how to do that. If you really wanted to do the full path integral in quantum gravity, uh, there'd be contribution from strings or whatever. Uh, we don't know how to do that, but um, sometimes we can nonetheless evaluate the dominant contributions to the path integral by including these saddle points. The key point that I'm making here uh, is the distinction between gravity and QFT. In QFT, um, so in QFT, to calculate Z of beta, uh, we fix the manifold. If you recall, an hour ago, we fixed the manifold to be a cylinder with size beta. In gravity, we're not allowed to fix the manifold. Uh, we have to integrate over metrics. So in gravity, um, to calculate Z of beta,
we fix only the boundary condition. on the manifold M. Um, and then the Einstein equations, um, I'm not sure if you can, okay. So the Einstein equations pick the manifold. It's up to the, the, the Einstein equations to, to tell you what manifold you're supposed to use. Let me pause for questions. So there was a question just now on the Zoom chat. Um, in case of more than one gravitational saddle points, uh, how do we figure out which one is dominant? Uh, yeah, so, um, well, we'll come to an example where that happens. So let me just answer this very briefly and we'll, we'll come to it. So if you have multiple saddles, uh, then you have a situation like this. where you have to sum them up. And um, typically what happens is just one of them dominates. It'll be the one of, um, uh, let's see, smallest Euclidean gravitational action. Um, however, um, we also have to worry about these matter terms. So really it's, it's whichever term is the biggest. The caveat there is that we don't really know which saddles we're supposed to include in the gravitational path integral. Uh, that's you know, it's, it's not true in general that you sum over all the saddles to calculate integrals. There are, there are the right ways to, to do saddle point approximations and they don't always involve sum over all the saddles. Um, that's input from the UV theory that we don't know how to determine from the low energy description in terms of Einstein gravity. Are there other questions? And there was a question on YouTube a bit earlier about whether it is possible to calculate the entanglement entropy uh, for non-conformal field theories using the replica method. Um, yes, although, yeah, so it is po it's certainly possible in principle. In principle, it's given by exactly the same calculation. In practice, it's much harder to calculate these partition functions in a non-conformal theory. Um, there are some examples where it's been done, say in massive free field, massive free field theories. Uh, but generally these calculations are, are pretty hard. Okay. Okay, so we'll go on. So, um, Okay, so we've described how to calculate the partition function. Uh, in principle, how to calculate the partition function in the gravitational theory. Now let's discuss the entropy. So the entropy is given by the usual thermodynamic formula, one minus beta d beta log z of beta. This is just the undergraduate formula for entropy. Um, now, we could just directly calculate z of beta. So say for the Schwarzschild black hole, we could calculate z of beta, uh, find the on-shell action of the Euclidean Schwarzschild black hole, calculate the contributions from matter, eventually take the derivative. We could do all those steps. Uh, and if you go through that, you'll find that the answer is area over four uh, plus the matter contribution um, for the fields outside of the horizon. I'm not going to go through that calculation. You could do that. But what I do want to do uh, is to sort of motivate why it ends up giving this answer. And I want to do this in a way that generalizes to our discussion coming up, um, which is that we can view this as a replica calculation. This is not necessary. This is not how Gibbons and Hawking did it, uh, but this is gonna make it very clear that we're doing very, something similar when we talk about replica wormholes. To view this as a replica calculation, let me just rewrite uh, the formula for entropy 
as one minus n dn log trace of e to the minus beta h to the n at n equals one. I haven't done anything here. This is simply a rewriting of the usual undergraduate formula for entropy. Uh, but now I'm going to think of n as an, inter as an integer. And then we can uh, then these uh, things showing up in the entropy are our replica partition functions. Okay, so we do have a replica manifold. Um, which calculates trace of e to the minus n beta h. Uh, so this is the path integral uh, on uh, with a boundary condition, uh, where the circle is size n beta instead of beta. Um, okay, so the, so when we do the path integral, we just specify that the boundary condition is a circle of size n times beta. Uh, and then the replica manifold itself should solve the Einstein equations. Now, in this case, this is very easy to do. You can The replica manifold is simply the Schwarzschild black hole, the Euclidean Schwarzschild black hole at inverse temperature n beta. To make this look even more like our replica calculation in QFT, um, I'm going to view this as a branched cover. So this manifold uh, which has a circle of size n beta, um, I can instead view as n copies of the cigar. Now each of these circles is size beta. And we need to glue them together. We can do this by introducing branch cuts on the cigar just like we did in our discussion of quantum field theory. And then we glue uh, the top of this, to the bottom of this, the top of this, to the bottom of this, top of this, to the bottom of that. Um, so we get this replica looking manifold that represents the um, saddle point with boundary condition n beta. Does this have boundary condition n beta? Well, let's check. Let's look at the, let's look at the circle at infinity. Um, if we are an ant walking around this circle at infinity, then we have to, what we, as, we, as we hit here, we find ourselves coming out down here. Then we have to walk around this circle. As we hit the branch cut again, we find ourselves coming out down here and walking around again. Um, so as desired, um, the boundary condition is a circle of size n beta. This is similar to our discussion of QFT. However, uh, now this manifold MN is um, a smooth manifold by Einstein's equations. Uh, 
So this is not just n copies of the original uh, Euclidean black hole. If you took n copies, so if you took n copies of the original Euclidean black hole, uh, then you would have these conical excesses. This is not what happens in gravity. If, as you make the circle bigger, the geometry adjusts itself by, it, it backtracks, it changes. Um, so the geometry adjusts in such a way that the manifold stays smooth uh, at the horizon. Um, let's phrase this in terms of the metric. So let's put a coordinate um, z on each of these sheets. Uh, and um, say what it means for the manifold to be smooth. So what it means for the manifold to be smooth um, is that the, so near the tip, which I'll put at z, at the coordinate value z equals zero, I can choose coordinates where this is at zero, um, there's a global coordinate W, well, it's, it's by global, uh, let me see, well, let me write it first. There's a, there's a global coordinate W, which is Z to the one over N. And uh, this coordinate covers all N sheets near the tip. So it, it, it's, it's, it's um, covering all of them because you have to go N, if you want, if you go N times around Z equals zero, then you go once around W equals zero. So this covers all n sheets. Um, uh, so that's a global coordinate. And for that to be smooth, uh, that means that the metric near the tip is dw dw bar. A smooth manifold is one that's locally r2. So we can write the metric as dw dw bar. Uh, and if we translate that back to the z coordinates, uh, that means that in z coordinates, uh, the metric near the tip, you can go through this quick exercise of doing the coordinate change and you'll find one over n squared zz bar to the one over n minus one dz dz bar. So it's a good exercise to work through. So what's the so what's the what's the conclusion? Uh, the conclusion is that in quantum field theory, the metric was flat in the z coordinate, which means the replica manifold is singular. In quantum gravity, the metric is flat locally uh, in the global coordinate w, which means the metric which means that the replica manifold is smooth. Let me pause here for questions. Are there questions? So there was one question on uh, how we decide the position of the branch cut in the gravitational case. Uh, good. So in, in this case, uh, it's dictated by symmetry that, that um, we, well, Let me say the general answer and, and, then, and then this case. So the general answer is that um, it's not up to us. We solve the Einstein equations. And the Einstein equations will give us a metric on this manifold. All, we are, all we're specifying with this picture is really the topology of the manifold and the boundary conditions. And uh, it's up to the Einstein equations to give us a metric. In other words, we might as well just declare that the branch point is at zero because that's a coordinate dependent statement. And then uh, after we calculate the metric in principle, that tells us where, like for say the proper, the proper distance to the branch point. Now in this calculation, that, that's not how this calculation is usually phrased because in this calculation uh, we have a rotational symmetry and um, it is much more convenient to 
impose that rotational symmetry around the Euclidean rotation, around Euclidean time, is much more convenient to impose that as an ansatz. And the only point we can choose is then the point at the tip. So in this case, we basically know that we should just put it, put it at the tip and impose the U1 symmetry. We'll come to cases in a minute where you don't have that symmetry, and then you really just have to solve the equations of motion, and um, gravity tells you where to put that defect. Thanks. Are there others? Okay, so if you do this calculation, of trace e to the minus n beta h, uh, you're gonna find e to the minus i e grav of the Euclidean black hole with temperature, inverse temperature n beta so times the contribution from the quantum field theory also on this metric g mu nu inverse temperature n beta. So far in this calculation, I've been describing all the steps. Now I'm going to skip a step and just try to roughly describe where it comes from. Uh, the idea, so in principle, you could do this calculation at any n by solving the Einstein equations, calculating the action, doing the path. In practice, we most care about the value near n equals 1, because that, that's what tells us the entropy. And um, the value near n equals 1 uh, can be calculated much simpler than the general one. In fact, there is no, in, in general, you can't calculate. Uh, in practice, you can't calculate all of these at finite n. But at n equals 1, there's a very simple formula for the replica partition function. And here it is. So it's e to the minus n i e grav of beta um, minus n minus 1 times area over 4 plus the entropy of the QF the entropy of the QFT on the region r greater than rs. I won't derive this here. Uh, you can look in the notes for, for some references to where you can learn more about the derivation. It's rather subtle, uh, but I can, motive, I can at least explain to you where the terms came from, and I think it makes sense. So the area over, so the area over four term, uh, this comes from the um, evaluation of the Einstein action near the tip of the, near the, near the tip of the cigar. Okay, and it comes from the back reaction. So note that um, the first term here, this is just n, this would just be if there were no back reaction and you just multiply the action by n to get the n-fold cover. Uh, but, um, and that, that's kind of similar to what you would do in quantum field theory. Uh, but because now the geometry is back reacting at the tip, there's an additional contribution to the action. And that additional contribution is the area term. So that's the origin of the area term. The second term here, um, so let me just sketch where this comes from. The second term uh, comes from the calculating the entropy of the quantum field theory, or sorry, the partition function of the quantum field theory on the replica manifold. How do you end up with an entropy from that calculation? Uh, well, that makes a lot of sense because if we go back to our picture here, 
this picture looks a lot like the picture we would draw if we were not doing quantum gravity, but we're just studying quantum field theory on the fixed background of the Euclidean black hole. If we were just doing quantum field theory on this Euclidean background, uh, we would replicate that manifold just as we did in our discussion of the interval in 2D CFT. We'd we would replicate that manifold, calculate that partition function, and that would give us the entropy. Now things are a little different because the manifold is back reacting, but we still get a contribution uh, given by the entanglement entropy of the matter fields. So that's where that second term came from here. Once you have this formula for the uh, replica partition function, you can calculate the entropy. of the black hole as one minus NDN ZN at uh, log ZN. At N equals one. Uh, and that's just gonna pick off that, that N minus one term um, up in the exponent. So this gives uh, S gen, the area plus the, um, matter entropy. Uh, I have a question. Yes. So are these saddle points uh, time independent? Um, yes, yeah, so the saddle points that I'm discussing now are, are time independent. We're in Euclidean signature, so time independent means that there's a right. rotational symmetry, it, it means that there's symmetry in, in rotating in Euclidean time. Uh, right. Since we, right now we're just discussing the, the Schwarzschild black hole. So these are, these are, these are, have this U1 symmetry. Ah, okay. So, so okay. We, are, we, we just have Schwarzschild symmetry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Although what I was about to say, I guess, is that if we, if we did have a dynamical situation uh, without that rotational symmetry, then, um, you can you can go through this whole calculation and you end up essentially with the same answer for the replica partition function there's one difference in that case uh which is that um now the location of the would not have to say area there's an area term here this is the area of the of the fixed point of the rotation for short shield uh, in general the location of that area term uh is is a dynamical variable, um, and you have to find an equation of motion for that for that location. I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, okay. I mean, I was a bit confused because recently there was this uh, paper uh, by some people on the pseudo hol holographic pseudo entropy, uh, where they discussed that if you have a Euclidean time dependent situation, then what is computed is uh, something called as a pseudo entropy. So I was just wondering uh, what would happen. I think the pseudo entropy paper was really about calculating the QFT term. It wasn't about right, calculating right. The, 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 we also have the area term. Right. Uh, so, so this is, this isn't quite the thing that was addressed in that. Paper. I see. But, but uh, the thing that happens for QFT, it won't happen once you go to, okay. Okay. Because they consider in the holographic setup that uh, idea that in the bulk, they had gravity and they were computing the entanglement the entropy in the CFT. So. Well, I haven't gotten far enough to quite explain this, but the pseudo entropy is, is um, this, this is not the pseudo entropy. The pseudo entropy is, is more like what we're going to calculate next, but it's involved in with what we're going to calculate next. But um, I think I don't want to go into too much of this. Okay, sure. Yeah, thanks. Other questions? Can I ask a question, please? Sure. So, um, as far as I understood that uh, we have not considered uh, the back reaction effect of the outside um, QFT matter fields, right? Uh, I mean, the well, matter fields outside R greater than R is, I mean. Yeah, let's see. So, um, for Euclidean Schwarzschild mm -hmm. in, in 
we, in principle, we are supposed to include that back reaction. There's situations where that's important, like the evaporating black hole. Yes. In the heart of Hawking, in, this, in the stationary state, like we're discussing now, the eternal black hole, that back reaction doesn't, doesn't do anything because um, the quantum state of the matter fields respects the same symmetry as the background and, and doesn't really affect this, this argument. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. So now we get to replica wormholes. I'll draw this picture again. We have a region R outside a black hole. I'm discussing the eternal black hole because it's easier to draw the pictures, but the argument also applies in general, our goal is to calculate S of R by the replica method. And we're not going to, we're just going to um, follow the usual rules and find the island formula. So we want to calculate trace of rho r to the n. Um, let's start with uh, writing a path integral representation of the operator rho r itself. What is the operator rho r as a path integral? I should say I'm temporarily going to set t to zero. Uh, so t is the t is the, is the the time of the endpoint of of r. I'm temporarily going to set t to zero. This isn't uh, so. This is just so I can draw the pictures. If if t is non-zero, then you would need pictures that glued together Euclidean manifolds and Lorentzian manifolds, and things go start getting awfully confusing. Uh, if we set t to zero, then we can just draw all the pictures in Euclidean. But the calculation still carries over to non-zero t. OK, so what is the path integral representation of rho r? Well, the, well let me draw it, and then I'll try to explain it. OK. So, um, as usual, we're doing gravity, so we should just specify a boundary condition. The boundary condition is thermal because we're in the finite, we're in the we're in the black hole. Uh, we shouldn't. We don't get to say what this manifold is. So I'm putting these question marks on the left to indicate that we're supposed to use the equations of motion to find this manifold. Now, uh, rho r is an operator on region r. So I should leave open cuts on this path integral along region R. Region R in the Euclidean path integral um, has two pieces. It has one here. This is, um, say, the, the, the R, region R on the right side of the Penrose diagram. And then it has another piece halfway around the Euclidean circle. So this is region R. It's the union of these two segments on the Euclidean circle. By going halfway around the Euclidean circle, uh, we get to the other side of the Penrose diagram. This is something that's familiar from, say, Rindler space. Uh, the way I like to think about it is that the Euclidean manifold uh, sort of they pick a different color here. The Euclidean manifold is sort of coming out of the page. Like if we if we take this if we take this diagram and we cut it at time zero, the Euclidean manifold is coming out of the page. So Euclidean time is the angular coordinate um, on this disk that comes out of the page. 
uh, and then we can see that uh, if we if we go halfway around the Euclidean time circle, we get from one side of the Penrose diagram to the other. So that's a representation of the operator. Uh, now um, we want to calculate the replica partition function. Let's start with n equals one where we're just calculating trace of row r. And actually trace of row r is the same as trace of row, the full partition function. So this is not gonna depend on region r, but I wanna describe how we would calculate it. Well, we would, we would uh, draw this boundary condition. Tracing over row r just glues the cuts to themselves. If you glue a cut to itself, uh, that is, we take the field data on the top of R and we say it's the same as the field data on the bottom of R and same goes for the other region R. Well, when you, when you glue it to itself like that, that's the same as just deleting the cut completely. You just ignore the fact that there was ever a cut there. So when we calculate trace of row R, uh, we should just find a manifold that fills in this boundary condition. Well, here's one. The Euclidean black hole. Okay, so that's the saddle point that calculates trace of row R. This is the same as trace of row. So this is the same as the usual Euclidean calculation of the, the partition function Z of beta that we were discussing a few minutes ago. Now we get to the fun part and to the crucial point in this lecture, which is what happens when you have n equals two. Well, what are we supposed to do in principle? We're supposed to take two copies of this thing, glue them together, and then uh, find all the saddles. We're calculating now trace of row r squared. So we're supposed to take two copies, there's one, then we're supposed to glue them together along region r. Uh, so we glue these together along region R. Uh, well, let me not try to draw the gluing lines. I'll just say that these two cuts are glued to either, each other and these two cuts are glued to each other. Um, this is the boundary. So, so now we're supposed to do the path integral with this boundary condition. But we're doing gravity. We don't get to say we don't get to we don't, we don't get to pick a manifold. We get to pick a boundary condition, and then we do the path integral. Okay, so if we do the path integral with this with this boundary condition, um, we can then um, evaluate the path integral by saddle points. There's an obvious saddle point, which looks just like two copies of the Euclidean black hole. So. Um, that is, we just take each of these cigars and fill it in with the Euclidean black hole. This I'll call, I'll refer to it as the Hawking saddle. I'm calling it the Hawking saddle because um, this will just give, so if you, if you use this saddle point, and there's an obvious one for any n, if you use this saddle point for any n, uh, then the entropy that you'll end up with from your replica method is just Hawking's calculation of the entropy. Because this looks just like doing the replica. This, this looks, this picture that we have now looks just like what we would do if we were just doing quantum field theory on a curved background, right? We just took two copies of the, of the manifold and we glued them together along the cuts. So that's how we, that's like a quantum field theory calculation. But the point is that there are other topologies that can contribute. So uh, what were we supposed to do? We were supposed to fill in this manifold with all the saddles. 
Uh, there's another one that looks like this. Where the Euclidean, the two Euclidean black holes uh, are joined inside the manifold. And there could also be plus dot 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 coming, say, from higher topology contributions, handles, and so on. This thing is called the replica wormhole. And this is going to be responsible for the island rule. Um, OK, question so far? So for the, for the uh, Hawking saddle that you mentioned, uh, it's like taking two copies of the previous thing. So uh, is there not the problem that you previously mentioned that the uh, geometry is not smooth, or we assume that back reaction has already taken care of uh, that non-smoothness. Ah, good. Okay, so um, in this case, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of region R as being very far from the black hole. Okay, so in when we when we discussed the um, smoothness at the tip, that point was deep inside the black hole. But now I'm thinking of the entire region R is being very far away from the black hole. Um, and I'm ignoring gravity at region R. So um, there could be some small back reaction here at the, here at the end point, uh, but it's going to be some tiny effect and it's going to be smaller the farther we are from region R. Uh, so that won't be an important contribution to this, to this uh, calculation. OK. Other questions? Um, on the Slack, there was a question about whether there are any subtleties with the regulation on these curved manifolds, uh, which are not flat. Subtleties with what was that? The regulation. Ah. Um, the regulation. So there's certainly subtleties. Um, Having so wick rotation on a curved manifold is is not a big deal. Uh, there's a that's a well defined procedure as long as the manifold has a time reflection symmetry. So these are cases. So the cases I'm looking at, like the Euclidean black hole, have a time reflection symmetry and they have a nice Euclidean manifold. There are other interesting cases. For example, a black hole that forms by collapse and then evaporates uh, that don't have a nice or don't at least have an obvious an obvious nice Euclidean continuation. There it's more subtle, um, but um, with some additional tricks, you can also apply the replica method in that case. There are certainly subtlety, other sub, there, there's various subtleties that I'm, that I'm glossing over here. And I should be clear that there are only a few cases where these calculations are, have actually been worked through in detail. For example, in Euclidean gravity coupled to a large N CFT. Um, and I'm describing them as, as general. I expect that they are general, but the details certainly have not been worked out for a, a general theory of gravity coupled to general matter in the general number of dimensions. Other questions? Maybe I should, I, to calibrate the last five minutes, let me um, check in about time. So, um, should I try very hard to end at 11.30? Or if I go an extra five minutes, will people be upset? Am I going into another session? I, I think we could uh, have an additional five minutes if that helps uh, with wrapping it up. OK, great. Um, so when you calculate these, uh, when you calculate these, so now there are multiple, con multiple saddle points contributing to the path integral. And um, these are going to give contributions that are showing up in the exponent. So let me call the first one S2 Hawking. I'm calling it S2 because we're calculating the second replica 
partition function. And this is what's called the second Renny entropy. Then there's an S2 wormhole coming from the wormhole saddle. And uh, we should compare and pick the one that dominates. So the one that dominates is the one with a smaller Rennie entry. Now, if you actually uh, calculate this, say in, in two-dimensional gravity where we can do these calculations in great detail, um, the contribution from the replica wormhole uh, is small. And this is, this is true in general. The contributions from replica wormholes are exponentially suppressed uh, because basically there's a, there's a cost in the action of nucleating this bridge uh, between the two sheets. So that costs a lot of action. Uh, and this, this contribution is always small. Um, sorry, by small, I'm when I say it's small, I'm talking about that e to the minus s is small. There's a significant contribution to S2, which suppresses that. Um, however, uh, when we're talking about the information paradox, we're usually interested in cases where the Hawking contribution is also exponentially suppressed. So if you think about the page curve, the time that you run into a paradox is when there's a great deal of entropy uh, in the Hawking radiation. Now, what we're calculating here is Rennie entropy. It's not quite entropy. Uh, but it's also very large in situations where you have a paradox. Uh, so this term is exponentially suppressed in situations with a paradox because the Hawking entropy in those situations is large. Um, and in, so that gives you some hope that the wormhole contributions might actually uh, become important. So for example, if we're talking about uh, the evaporating black hole, this Hawking contribution starts out dominant, but S2 Hawking grows with time. So it's time dependent. And eventually the Hawking, the Hawking saddle has a very tiny contribution and the wormhole saddle can take over. That will correspond to the transition in the entropies at the page time. Okay, so let's wrap up this calculation. Uh, to do that, we rewrite the wormhole Well, I should say that there, of course, we have to do this for all n uh, in order to do the replica trip. So you know for it, at n equals three, there are saddles that look like this and so on at higher values of the replica number. Um, and to deal with that, so it um, starts to get cumbersome to draw these drawings of infinite values of n. Uh, so to deal with that, we can rewrite the replica manifold as a branched cover of the original black hole. And the way we do that is by introducing new dynamical uh, is by introducing a new branch type. This is a dynamically appearing branch cut with dynamical defect operators at its endpoints. What this branch cut is doing is it's just it's it's just telling you that these things are glued together. So uh, if you if you look back at at uh, this picture of the wormhole, um, it says that as you approach the tip of sheet one, you find yourself in sheet two. Well, that's exactly what this uh, what this branch that is doing. Now, um, the metric. Is smooth. Because this is uh, inside the black hole somewhere where you have to use the Einstein equations and solve the equations and you'll find a smooth metric. So the metric at these branch points is smooth. Um, now we can go through exactly the same calculation uh, of the partition function. 
remember what we did for the entropy is we expanded near n equals one um, and calculated the partition function. So we can do the same thing here. And what we find is z is, let me write it first, there's an integral over moduli of exponential minus n i n equals one plus n minus one times the area over four um, plus s matter And the crucial point is that it's S matter on I union R, where R, if we go, go back up to this picture here, R is the region whose entropy we're calculating. But as soon as this wormhole appeared, there was this new branch cut that showed up in our path integral. So let's call that branch cut I. And when we start doing quantum field theory calculations on this manifold, which has branch, which has branches along R and along I, uh, then that's like the quantum field theory calculation of the entropy on the joint region I union R. So this comes from the QFT replica trick. including the wormhole. The last thing I need to explain is the appearance of these moduli here. So the moduli are, uh, I briefly mentioned before, those are just the endpoints of uh, region I in the, uh, well, in general, it's the location of region I. Um, so in two dimensions, the endpoints of region I. So the idea is you fix a region I, you calculate the action of this replica manifold. This is the effective action that you get. And um, now if we convert this into an entropy by the usual formula, we find S of R is equal to min X over I of S gen I union R um, because the extremization of the moduli is our final equation of motion. And um, so integrating over the moduli and, and finding the saddle is the same as extremizing the effective action. And that effective action showing up here is just the generalized entropy itself. So the final conclusion uh, is that this wormhole calculation gives exactly the Eilen rule for the von Neumann entropy of R. Okay, I know I skipped a lot of steps there, but I hope that was um, I hope that was roughly clear what the where these contributions were coming from and why they were there. So let me just um, end by so we'll I'll, we'll come to questions in a minute. Let me just end by um, flashing up my conclusion slide. Um, I won't write it out so that we can save a little bit of time here. Um, and I'll just go through this briefly in words. So what we showed in these lectures uh, today, we showed that the Euclidean gravitational path interval gives the island formula for the entropy. As I described yesterday, the island formula for the entropy gives you a page curve for the radiation that's consistent with unitarity. The page curve is one aspect of the information paradox, but it's not the whole information paradox. So let me uh, end by mentioning how this leaves open some important questions, and, and also, I think, even more, even, even more interestingly, uh, raises some new ones. So what is the what is the crucial piece of this that's missing? Uh, and 
I think one way of saying it, so what is the crucial aspect of the black hole information puzzle that's missing in this explanation? And the answer to that, uh, which was alluded to in some of the discussion yesterday, is that this was a Euclidean calculation. It's a Euclidean calculation that gives you the entropy, but it doesn't really tell you how the initial density matrix, say for the black hole, evolves into the final density matrix. In other words, it doesn't tell you the S matrix for how, how initial states evolve into final states. Another way of saying it is that we, didn't, we don't know the transition rule that, um, that, that of how things evolve in Lorentzian time. It's just a rule, it's a, it's a Euclidean calculation of the entropy that gives you the right entropy directly from the low energy theory, um, but somehow does it without ever knowing rho itself. And in fact, I think it's, it's probably impossible to calculate rho from the low energy theory because uh, the evolution rule itself is something that will depend on the UV completion. It's like if you burn a piece of coal, uh, then if you wanna know the final density matrix of the radiation, you better be able to, um, you better be able to simulate the, the, the evolution of inside the coal. And that will depend on the UV theory. It's not just a fact about thermodynamics. So that question, what is the Lorentzian version of all this in terms of states evolving into states? That's related to a question I raised at the beginning of the lecture is about how we understand the microstates that are responsible for the entropy. Talking entropy, uh, there's a Euclidean calculation that gives the right entropy, uh, but it's still an open question what that entropy, like how you understand the states that that entropy is counting. And there's a similar, is completely analogous for the page curve. There's a Euclidean calculation that gives the page curve. We think this is the correct page curve in a unitary theory, um, but it doesn't answer the question of what is the density matrix and what are the quantum, what are the microstates in that density matrix that are actually giving this the Norman entropy. This business has also raised some new interesting questions. Uh, there are questions about how to decode the interior. There are some proposals for this in the literature uh, that I think are really interesting using tools from quantum information theory. It's raised a question, uh, another aspect of this is that it raises some questions about factorization of the path integral. So there's been a lot of discussion in the last year about whether uh, the island rule and replica wormholes are really calculating the von Neumann entropy of the radiation in, in a theory of quantum gravity or whether they're calculating that quantity in some kind of average sense. There are other situations in Euclidean path integrals for quantum gravity where um, wormholes indicate, where the existence of wormholes indicates that, uh, that, that you're calculating an average, not an observable in a fixed theory. Now those are a bit different from replica wormholes, uh, but I think it's a very interesting set of questions to explore. Uh, so these are other important unsolved aspects of the information puzzle that aren't answered um, just by being able to do these Euclidean gravity calculations. So I will stop there and take questions for as, as long as if we have time for any questions. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you very much, um, Tom, for uh, this wonderful series of lectures. So maybe we have time for one or two quick questions. And and I'm answering questions on Slack too, so we can we can uh, we can do that too. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I have a question. So if you go to the for final formula that you derived uh, involving the S matter and so on. Yeah, so in this one, uh, the area term has the boundary of the new branch cut region I. Can you, uh, how does that come in uh, in this picture? Or why does the area term has only the boundary of that region? Can we understand it from the picture or any physical understanding that you talked about? Yeah, it's very similar to, it's very similar to the derivation of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So remember in that derivation, um, we ended up with a contribution from the Einstein action at the defect. Yeah. In this case, in this case, these the the defects are these endpoints here of region I. 
Um, so for exactly this, it's really exactly the same reason. The, the calculation of the action um, in, in Gibbons Hawking is the same as the calculation here. And it gives a contribution from the um, back reaction near these, near these twist points. Um, why is it localized? I guess you're asking why is it localized okay. near, the, near the defect? Um, yeah, yeah. The, I, the, I think the, the easiest way, to, the, the best I can do with a short answer to that question is that the other contributions that are not exactly at the defect, the other contributions vanish by the equations of motion. Because notice that we're doing a linearized variation of an action. We're, yeah. we're looking at the action and we're varying n to n, n equals one plus epsilon. So we're doing a linearized variation of the action. And because it's a, because it's, you're varying around a solution, most of the contributions to the action vanish. They don't all vanish because um, you're also varying the boundary condition. And uh, the equation of motion only, only gives zero variation if you fix the boundary condition. So there's one little contribution to the action and that you can write as localized. Okay, so um, maybe uh, unless we go too far over time, um, if there's a very quick question, I guess we can do it. Um, and otherwise, uh, yeah, maybe I have a quick question. Okay. May I? Yeah. So I was just wondering, what is uh, say we are in a setting where we can do analytic continuation, and then what will be the interpretation of this replica wormhole contribution in Lorentzian setting, like after we analytically continue back to Lorentzian setting? Well, the, there, there is a, so it depends if we're at, at, at finite n or we're just talking about entanglement. So if we're talking finite n, say n equals two, okay. uh, then there are gonna be complexified saddles. So like if we go back to the evaporating black hole and wanna calculate the wormholes there, um, the, it's going to be pretty complicated, but there are going to be complex saddles that solve the equation of motion uh, and give the island rule in that case. Um, I think the, maybe the better answer to your question is that the Lorentzian inter interpretation of these replica calculations is the island rule itself. The island rule is something that we can apply in Lorentzian and it, it, um, well, together with these statements about entanglement wedge reconstruction, it sort of gives us a Lorentzian interpretation of these calculations and that it, it tells us how regions in the Lorentzian space-time are encoded uh, in regions elsewhere, like region I being encoded in the radiation R. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then I guess the, those are all questions for now. So maybe we can uh, unmute yourself and uh, thank uh, Thomas for his series of lectures.